because this is going to be a theoretical talk, but it's a somewhat different theoretical theme uh, than the early ones we talked about. Um, so I mean, I'm in condensed matter theory, so one of my specialties is working with tensor networks. And part of the goal of this collaboration is to figure out what tensor networks like Merrick teaches about quantum gravity. But really, it goes both ways, because there's lots of questions within condensed matter physics that we, about tensor networks that we don't know the answer to. In particular, um, in condensed matter theory, we're using these tensor networks as an actual like computational tool to try and figure out questions about you know, the Hubbard model, superconductivity, spin liquids, etc. Um, and especially in 2D, there's a lot of open questions about whether this approach should even work. So the theme of this talk is sort of thinking about the direction. Uh, the holography can tell us something kind of generic about entanglement in many body systems. Uh, can that inform uh, how we're going about using tensor networks um, in condensed matter? So three examples of tensor networks you guys might have heard about. Um, certainly the most common in holography is MERA. So each of these junctions here is some tri or four-valent tensor. Uh, you add a set of spins here lying on the boundary, which is your physical Hilbert space. And once you specify what the tensors are, you contract it together in this network here, and you get onslaughts for a wave function on the boundary. Um, but there's no reason you have to you know, contract it with this topology here. The first tensor network that was actually discussed was in 1D. Back then, it was called a matrix product state. And here what you do is you just cut off the bulk and just consider a tensor, a set of tensors like this. Contract them together, and you get a bunch of free indices here, uh, which gives a wave, uh, wave function for, say, a one-dimensional spin chain or a one-dimensional Hubbard model. Or, of course, you can, uh, you know, generalize this to two dimensions, where you contract them together into a grid and get a wave function for a two-lattice model. Okay, so the way we use these in condensed matter is generally what we're given is not the tensor network, but we're actually given a Hamiltonian for some you know, actual material, like the Hubbard model, quantum Hall effect, etc. And what we'd like to know is what phase of matter is that Hamiltonian in? Okay, so and in particular, we're generally going to be interested in uh, the properties at zero temperature, so we want to know what the ground state of that Hamiltonian is. So how do we use a tensor network to do it? Uh, well, it's nothing more complicated than the variational method. If you want to estimate the ground state energy given some Hamiltonian, and you're given a variational ensemble, in our case, it's going to be a tensor network here, then we can just compute the expectation value not, then we just compute the expectation value of the energy for that ensemble. And then we minimize overall possible values of the tensor value of this energy here. Uh, that gives us an approximation of the ground state energy, and you'd say that the best tensor network here is going to give you a state rather close to the ground state. Okay, so when does the variational method work? Well, it works so long as the ground, the true ground state is actually your variational model. So the central question here then is, is there a reason to expect that, say, in 2D, a projected entangled pair state, or PEPs, or in 1D matrix product state, is actually a good approximation of ground states in one or two dimensions? Okay, so what do we know about this at a theoretical level? It turns out in 1D we know almost everything. Uh, this is work going back to Hastings, uh, Ristratus, Rock, and others. So what do we know in 1D? Uh, the first thing we know is I'm generally going to restrict my attention to gapped ground states rather than gapped in this case. Uh, one thing we know is that if you have a gapped ground state, gapped ground state, then this applies a special restriction on entanglement known as the area law, which you are familiar with. That was proved by Matt Hastings. And we know further that if a state has an area law for the von Neumann entropy in 1D, there's a very precise sense in which it's well approximated by a matrix product state. So in 1D, these ideas are kind of equivalent, and that means we know that uh, doing the variational method using MPS is going to always give accurate results for gap ground states. This is actually what the DMRG algorithm is, you may have heard of. So this gives us a polynomial efficient algorithm, it turns out, to compute the ground state of any gapped field theory in one dimension. And people, which might be interested in some of the high energy people here, I've motivated it as an uh, ensemble for a lattice model, but people actually generalize this to continuum. And they can use the same DMRG method to find uh, the properties of ground states of actual continuum field theories if there's a mass gap in one dimension. Okay, so what about... Can you specify the bond dimension of the... 
Yeah, so really what happens here is, right, there's some bond dimension I'll call it chi, which tells us the size of these tensors. And when I say, oh, gap ground states are well approximated by matrix product states, the way you're going to formalize this is how does the fidelity per unit length scale with the bond dimension? Uh, and what Hastings, Restrada, and Sorok brothers were able to prove is the precise quantitative relation. Uh, so it turns out that the fidelity per unit length, if there's a gap, uh, reduces faster than any power law. So that's the precise sense in which it's well approximated. Yeah. Okay, so what do we know in 2D? Uh, we could start out hoping that the same thing is true. Maybe we have gap ground states area law and sign of the peps here. So one thing which is trivial true is by the kind of lattice version of Rutaki and Nagi, we know that if you have a peps and you look at the amount of entanglement in some region, because that region only has a finite number of these bonds coming out, peps implies area law. I don't think there's any proof, but people generally believe that if you have a gap ground state in 2D, that implies area law. I don't know that it's a reverse proof. Um, but it's known, there's work by Jens Eisert and others, that even if a state has an area law, for every single region you can draw, you can write down states which are not the ground state of any local Hamiltonian. So this is certainly not true. Uh, and furthermore, a, um, a corollary of that is that this is not true. So knowing states have area laws doesn't tell you that they're ground states of local Hamiltonians. So somehow this like entanglement information is not nearly rich enough to like describe what's special about ground states. Uh, local Hamiltonian means nearest neighbor or neighbor? No, it could be pick any finite range interaction. Any finite range. But, uh, and pick a lo local Hilbert space dimension. Any fixed finite range interaction can show that the states of the area law which can never be a ground state. Uh, if you remove the ga word gap, is this been true? Um, so if I put gapless, we believe CFTs, like conformal field theory, still have the area law. Yeah. But if you have like a condensed matter, we're often interested in metals, for instance. And if you have a Fermi surface, there's a logarithmic violation of the area law. Okay. Yeah. So for 1D, when you were talking about the continuum limit things, were you talking about the Maserani Fidic Landau family of results or a different one? Um, no, it's more work coming out of uh, Ignatius Rock and Frank Verstrada's group. Uh, oh, wait, wait, sorry, the proof about yeah. whether this works? About uh, about uh, what the necessary condition on the gap is for continuum uh, theories. Continuum theories, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. What I was, I mean, the proofs here were by Hastings in the lattice case. Uh -huh. uh, and people had worked out actual practical numerical algorithms in the continuum case, but that wasn't a mesh that was... Yeah, I guess what I was wondering about is uh, how is this related to the, like, um, to the AGSP story? Oh, I know, because I'm not familiar with it. Um, well, there's, there, if you have some promise on the scaling of the size of the gap, then it guarantees for you, uh, in 1D, then it guarantees for you some facts about the form of the ground state, whether or not it has to be And I was wondering if it was some condition. Um, potentially, yeah, but let's probably I discuss that. that tool they use to well, this was proved before that. I mean, this was proved by Hastings. I think they gave that efficient algorithm to find the... Yeah, so what, certainly what Vidic and Mesh did was they proved... So right now I'm just talking about the variational manifold. It doesn't prove that you can find the state efficiently. Certainly Vidic and Mesh proved that you can polynomially efficiently find the best state as well. <clears throat> okay, so the question I want to ask in this talk is... The area law is like too impoverished to tell us what special background states in 2D. Um, this is the basic thing you would measure if you're just talking about bipartite entanglement. So that suggests that we need to think about multipartite entanglement in 2D to figure out what special background states are. So that's what I want to talk about here, and that's where uh, this is actually working with Brian Simulet and inspired me to start thinking about this. Um, so ultimately, I would love to find what are the necessary and sufficient conditions on entanglement in 2D to say, imply that something has a PEPS representation. Can I ask for this stuff? Are you assuming like chi is fixed as the thing goes to infinity, like constant? Uh, like for this result here? Uh, yeah, both. Well, okay, the, the real thing you want here, I'm being kind of schematic, is you have some measure of error, like say fidelity, divided by system size, and you want to know how this scales with bond dimension. And so the sense in which there's a left-right arrow here is that if there's an area law, 
ready for ready entropy is less than one, then this error decays faster than any power law as a function of chi. That's the type of result you'd actually like to prove. Some of these areas, like if something's a matrix product state of finite bond dimension, you can certainly prove it's an area law, and you can certainly prove it's a gap ground state. That's an exact statement. Okay, so I would love to be able to find the necessary and sufficient conditions here. Um, but just to start us out, um, what I want to do is think about a particular phase of matter. It's a gap phase of matter uh, called the integer quantum Hall effect. Um, it obeys the area law, uh, but people have conjectured for a long time that this particular phase of matter, the integer quantum Hall effect, uh, it's kind of like a folklore that it couldn't be written down as a, as a PEP state. Um, so I want to identify for this phase of matter, can we say what's special about the entanglement, some multi-party entanglement measure uh, about the integer quantum Hall effect, which might imply that it can't take on PEPs more. So let me first, uh, for the high energy theorists among us, tell you what this phase of matter is. Um, it's, a, it's in 2D, when I say 2D, so it's in 2 plus 1D. It's an example of something called a chiral topological order. It, it is completely gapped, but it has a kind of cool property. Let's say you have uh, your 2D system here, which is in this chiral topological order. This is like your piece of graphene or uh, gallium arsenide or something, so the electrons are living here. And let's say this is the vacuum state here. It's outside the material. This is the gap phase here. What you find is no matter how you terminate the sample, try as hard as you want, um, you always find that there's gapless excitations that live only on the edge of the sample. Uh, and these gapless excitations, the gapless edge, is described by a 1 plus 1d chiral conformal field theory. You just take a CFT and keep the right moving part of your scroll for not the um, So you know a schematic for it, for instance, would be that if you, in certain case, it's rather simple. You just have some mode at the edge, which has an energy dispersion relation, which goes uh, to the right, but not the left. Um, this, for instance, is what the edge of the fractional quantum Hall effect or the integer quantum Hall effect looks like. Um, so the invariant you might describe here is you know that uh, CFTs are described by something by the central charge but you can separately ask about the central charge for the right movers and the left movers. So these are theories where the right moving charge minus the left moving charge is not zero. Uh, to be fancy, they're described by the term in the Lagrangian, which is the so-called gravitational Chern-Simons term. Actually, I might be lying about the transition here. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, this is the, the spin connection. 2D, you can write down a churn science term for the spin connection. And the effective field theory for these chiral phases uh, is in the Lagrangian like this. Um, this actually implies physically measurable responses. For instance, there's something called a thermal Hall effect, where you put a temperature gradient across the sample this way, and you find an energy current this way with a quantized coefficient, which is this chiral central charge. And that's actually been measured in the lab, which is pretty cool. So we've measured uh, gravitational anomalies in condensed matter systems. Okay, so what do we know about entanglement in these chiral topological orders? Well, the first thing you could do is just cut out a subregion of A. And per usual, ask what is the von Neumann entropy for the region A? And if you well, do this, Michael, we could yeah. do by turn theory. Yeah, yeah. So this, in terms of the gauge yeah. field, there'd be yeah. about the, the yeah. um, actual um, Hall effect. We're talking about electrons moving. We're talking yeah. about a lattice system. Yeah, and that's uh, this could be a lattice system, sure, yeah. So it could be something. Yeah. So one example is the Hall effect, which we usually think of as in the continuum. Yeah. But people have found other systems, like p plus i superconductors is one example, um, where you don't actually have an electrical Hall effect, but the thing that they always have is the thermal Hall effect, which is this, which is why I talked about that. Yeah. Um, more recently, there's spin systems, for instance. So this yeah. is called thinium trichloride, where Electrically, there's a gap, there's no charged excitations at all, but it, they measure this thermal hall. 
Okay, so what does the entangler behave in a phase like the integer quantum Hall effect? We get the so-called area law, where if partial A is the length of the boundary, and then there's a correction here, but it's a completely uninteresting correction. It just decays exponentially, where L is the typical size of the area here, and sees some correlation length, and there's basically nothing else. Um, so the behavior of this sort of entanglement is completely uninteresting. You'd get the same thing if you had a almost unentangled set of spins with just very local correlations. Uh, so the bipartite doesn't tell you anything about it. Okay, but the fact that, and what is this going to have to do with holography, uh, you know, because you have this signature which is a CFT at the edge, this suggests that perhaps what we need to do um, is look at some multi-party entanglement measure of conformal field theories and then bootstrap that somehow to figure out what's special about the entanglement here. My intuition was somehow, if you did put it on a disk, maybe what you need to do is cut the disk into three regions, A, B, C, and because the edge of the disk always has this edge state here, maybe that would mean there's some multi-party like, measure here that tells you that you're forced to have an edge state at the edge. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about um, multi-party entanglement measures of conformal field theories. Now, unlike bipartite entanglement, bipartite entanglement is really only one type, and that's the Bell pair. So there's kind of one canonical measure, and that's the von Neumann entropy. As soon as you talk about three parties, we believe there's actually infinitely many different types of entanglement. You know, there's Bell pairs, there's GHZ, there's W states, um, but it could go on and on. And accordingly, there's many different types of multi-party entanglement measures. So for this talk, I'm going to be considering one called the entanglement of purification. This is maybe a historical accident because I've been thinking about it with, with Brian. Uh, there's probably something much simpler at the end, but this is what we figured out. So what is the entanglement of purification? Um, it's something where you take in a mixed state on two parties, maybe, and it's going to spit out a number, entanglement of purification, maybe. Um, but I'm going to translate between two different points of view. We can either think of it as a measure of mixed states on two parties, or via the process of purification, we can always view a mixed state on two parties as a pure state on three parties. And oftentimes, I'll, and this is the sense in which the multi-party entanglement, we give it a pure state with A, B, C, and then we're going to measure uh, properties of those two parties there. Okay, so it's a somewhat annoying definition. Here's how, here's how it works. So, you're, you start out with a mixed state here, and any mixed state, you can always find a particular purification. Um, and without loss of generality, you can always assume that the purification, party C, is itself a tensor product of two parties, A prime and B prime. So the picture I'm going to draw is that you start out with a mixed state on AB, row AB, and you choose a particular type of purification, such that it becomes a pure state a, A prime, B, B prime. Uh, this structure is actually probably pretty familiar to you. Like one of the purifications you often work with is the thermal field double state, where you start with the Hilbert space on AB, you just double it, consider an identical copy, and then you have a canonical way of purifying this as a pure state on just twice the Hilbert space. Okay, but when you write down a purification, there's actually many different ways to purify it, and the reason is. Suppose you start out with a purification ABC, or let me think of it as A in this case, A prime, B prime, and then you act with any unitary operation acting only on the states you use to purify it with. Then because we trace out A prime and B prime, this is also a good purification. So purifications are ambiguous up to any unitary acting on the uh, purifying part. So entanglement of purification is defined in the following way. We minimize over all possible things you could do on A prime, B prime, all unitaries here, the value of the entanglement between A, A prime and B, B prime. So the picture is, find this pure state, we measure the entanglement for a cut like this, and then you act with any unitary you want to here to try and minimize the entanglement between the left and right, and that 
minimal values called the entangled interpretation. Somewhat complicated measure to calculate, you can imagine, because you know, if, this, if there's 20 spins in here and 20 spins in here, you need to minimize over all unitaries acting on a Hilbert space of size 2 to the 20 by 2 to the 20, so it's a very complicated optimization problem. Okay. Okay, so why was I thinking about this extremely complicated thing? It's actually due to uh, an earlier paper of Brian and I's on what the holographic interpretation of entangled purification was. This, uh, is, the, this is roughly the entanglement that I was saying that in Rutland's study. Um, which, in which paper? That might be the entanglement of the thermal field double. Yeah, it's just entanglement of thermal field double, but when you split, when you split the system, what I call vertically instead of horizontally. Yeah. So you're saying start with, you know, this, this sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Slice it that way. And this is kind of in this picture here. This is a, this is b. Yeah. This is a prime and b prime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So before doing this minimization here, you, so if you just measure that entanglement, that would indeed be this entanglement here. Yeah. But this is now saying that you can do whatever you want to this side of the unitary. Right. How much can you reduce it? And that, that then gives EP. OK, so what we conjectured was that in a holographic theory, you could compute EP in the following way. Uh, let me suppose that ABC, I'm, I'm going to do the simplest case. Let's suppose ABC is the ground state of CFT. We can draw everything into my 1D. So here's my CFT. And let's take this region to be A, this region to be B, and C is just the rest of the system. Then uh, the conjecture for the dictionary was as follows. If you want to know the entanglement purification for AB, you first draw the Takianagi surface for the two of them together. So this is the entanglement wedge. And then you look over all ways of splitting the entanglement wedge in two in order to bipartition it into stuff touching A and stuff touching B. So in that case here, you draw this curve here. This is the shortest curve you can draw which splits the entanglement wedge into the two halves, and then the length of this curve is EP. So that was the conjecture. Um, and uh, uh, Tadashi Takianaki had the same, same idea just, uh, just before us. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this too much. We'll just assume this. This was, this was the inspiration for thinking about EP. Okay. Now, it turns out that EP itself um, is not super convenient to work with. Uh, but let me tell you two key properties it has, which is going to motivate a slight modification. So the first is that from strong subadditivity, you can prove that EP between two parties uh, is always greater than or equal to the mutual information between the two parties. And whenever you have an inequality, it's useful to ask what happens when the inequality is saturated? Oh, sorry, this is divided by two. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so this follows from strong subadditivity. Uh, what's special about a state which saturates it? So you can show that EP is equal to one half I only if the state ABC takes a following form, which we'll call a triangle state. So. Suppose you have a state on three parties A, B, C, where each of the three parties can itself be set and uh, split up into a tensor product of two sets of qubits, uh, such that the only entanglement of the system is bell pairs shared between A, C, bell pairs shared between A, B, and uh, bell pairs shared between C, B. So if a state can be written, basically a state can be written like this, if and only if EP is equal to one half I. So that suggests that this positive quantity I'll call G, uh, which I'll write as 2 EP minus I, which is greater than or equal to 0. This is a measure of a state which gives the obstruction to thinking of it as just bell pairs shared between the three parties. So in that sense, it's a measure of some like truly tripartite entanglement. 
Um, just as an example, let's compute it. Well, I'll quote what the answer is for the GDT state. If I write down a GDT state, one over square n i i i. So this is just the n dimension n dit version of that GHC state. We've chosen the normalizations here such that you get g is equal to log log n. Um, I don't want to say it's measuring GHC because there's many other tripartite types of entanglement, but that's one. Okay, so it turns out that this G has a kind of cool property. So um, if you pick two regions, we know that I generally actually has a UV divergence. It goes like a log of a length over A. Uh, same thing happens with EP. EP also has a UV divergence. Uh, but when you take this subtraction, uh, all the UV divergence part cancels. Um, and it turns out you get a, a cool universal number. The setup I'll look at is the following. Suppose I take a CFT on a ring in one dimension and split it up as A, B, C, where these regions could be any particular size, and then you compute G. If you just go through with that uh, geometric definition, you can compute it within holography, and what you find is that G is equal to the central charge log 2, irrespective of the size of the regions. So you don't get this log L over A stuff. You just immediately get the central charge. Um, so the first thing we want to know is whether this was actually true. I mean, this is true. It's conjectured to be true within holography. Is it actually true for like a 1D lattice model, like the Ising model, Lexx, Z, Heisenberg, et cetera? Uh, so we went ahead and computed it, which you should be impressed by, because I told you that computing it, we did it for system size between like uh, 1 and 100 spins. So we have some. Some spin chain, periodic boundary conditions. This, well, L ran from 3 all the way to 100. And we had a clever way using uh, matrix product states to actually do this brute force minimization problem to compute the entanglement purification. Uh, we just checked uh, what is G. So let me plot what we found schematically. This is the size of the ring, 1 over L. And this is the G that we computed for, say, some tripartition. We found that, of course, for a really small system, there's some correction that then decays the power law to some universal value. Uh, and this universal value uh, was impervious to adding, you know, at the lattice scale, you can add some relevant operators while maintaining criticality. But you find that this number here doesn't depend on it, so it's universal. Yeah. So it seems like you have to uh, optimize on two to the hundred to the hundred degrees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So granted, we didn't do that. Um, what we did was um, so yeah. So it's a matrix product state trick. The idea is that okay. So let's say there's thirty three spins in here. Naively, you would have to work with the Hilbert space of size two to the thirty three. Uh, but you know inside here, the actual entanglement of this region is S is equal to C over 3 log, you know, LA divided by A. And generally the entanglement in this region is actually much smaller than the maximal 2 to the 30. So we have some trick where we first compress this region into the relevant part of the Hilbert space, and then you can reduce it to a tractical minimization problem where it's maybe over a 10,000 dimensional. Space. So you do the compression first. Yeah, yeah just, and this compression's first, and then it is just brute force optimization to minimize overall possible purifications within the compressed space. Um, so it takes a while, but it's tracked. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in the bulk topology, all the people like uh, like to Kitab and Presky uh, define some topological entanglement yeah. entropy by yeah. some tri yeah. bipartite. Yeah, yeah, but really, that's a linear combination of bipartite entropy. Uh -huh. It's this SA plus SB plus SC. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. But that doesn't detect, so that detects if there's anions, if there's fractionalization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it just gives zero for the integer quantum Hall effect. I see. So, so this you, oh, I see. So this you can detect, like, for instance, that's an integer, like, say, uh, integer yeah, quantum I, Hall. I haven't said like how yet, but I'm going to claim that if you measure this G thing for the integer quantum Hall effect, you'll get something not zero, whereas for trivial case, you'll get zero. 
Okay. And that's the first entanglement measure I know which detects parallel tumble. Sorry, is there any way to see that geometrically? Do I get to see over the 3D block too? Um, you can kind of see geometrically that the V part is going to cancel. It's not obvious. I mean, it's some kind of non-trivial fact about the geometry of EDS that you get this particular. So is it this is going to be the length of the curve or something, or is the length of what? I mean, this like two semi lengths of the curve in the ball, or it's something like that. The curve. Is the difference of lengths of curves. Oh, yeah, I mean, the curves ought to be constant always. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so G is indeed a universal property of the CFT. Uh, unfortunately. Though perhaps not surprisingly, it's not C over 3 log 2. So we've done it for the transverse field icing model, tricritical pots, bosons at different uh, compactification radius. They all give some different universal number, but it's not this. Uh, which is not surprising. I mean, this is probably just true at large n, but in general, it might depend on the cooperator content of the CFT. But this came from some matrix products, though? Uh, this came, this here, yeah. this prediction came from, you know, Brian and I and others had conjectured that EP is this entanglement wedge. So if you just go through that with geometry, you predict this by relating you know, the radius of ES to central charge. So this is the holographic prediction. Then we numerically do it using matrix product states. We find that it is universal. It doesn't depend on the size of these regions, which is kind of cool. Um, it's just that the coefficient does not see. It's some other order one number, which I don't know how to predict. I mean, I'd love to know, given OPEs, scaling dimensions, whatever is CFT, what is this number we find? It's universal, but I don't know what the answer is. Sorry, my last question. Uh, then, uh, if, I, if I understand correctly, to, to, to show the EP equal to this curve, you, you basically look at the verification, but you look at the geometry of your yeah. verifications. Yeah, so you see the that If you look at not the actual, optimize not over the actual verifications, but you can optimize over geometric verifications. Number or yeah, this I guess technically is kind of optimization over geometric purification. I mean, in your, in, in, your, in your simulation, in your calculations, do you know if you get optimized so over all units optimized over geometric uh, purifications? Then you, you get well, uh, I mean, this is a kind of deep question. If I do transverse field icing model, and so we just optimize over all purifications, dealt with this lattice model, I guess you could. Would you have a way if I gave you the unitary to say whether it's approximately a geometric? Uh, you know I mean? On the boundary, I thought that they, they, they look at different regions. So, so yeah. you said, okay, this is A prime, this is B prime. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. You, you, can, you can play the same game here. And, and if these two numbers are very different, then that's also a sign that maybe that proposal is not actually. I mean, that, that proposal is a geometric entanglement of purification, but it might be, there might be a gap between a geometry entanglement of purification and an actual entanglement of purification, and then you, you can see that here. Yeah, maybe, let's discuss that after. This is interesting to think about if you actually, you could do this within Mara, for instance. Brian and I have some ideas about this. I don't think this is necessarily means that it wasn't geometric, actually. Because, I mean, yeah, let's talk about it. So I guess I only have a couple more minutes, but I'd, I'd like to discuss maybe schematically. We have this multi-party universal surprising invariant of 1D CFTs. Uh, how could you use this to detect integer quantum Hall effect? Chiral order in 2D. Um, so first what I want to do is cheat in the following way. Suppose I took the integer quantum Hall effect, and I'm just going to put it on geometry, which is annulus. So this is just a warm up. Now, so, okay, so this is the this is the between bolt. This is just space I'm showing here. Uh, but there's two boundaries here. So we know because it's integer quantum Hall effect for a chiral theory that there's a CFT living on the top edge and a CFT living on the bottom edge. And suppose what I did is I just take the system and split it up into A, B, and then everything else is C. If I look down on it from the top. What I have is the two edges together give the right moving and left moving part of the CFT. And by cutting the bolt in this way, I've just cut it into regions A 
B and everything else was C. So you might predict if you just calculate G minus one half I for this annulus, so I'll call this G2E, that you'd get exactly this universal G of the CFT. And you can try it and not surprisingly, you do. So uh, it's saying that because of the way you take EP minus one half I, all the short range bell pairs coming from this tuning bolt here just get canceled out. Um, and you end up only detecting some three part type measurement coming from the two capital settings. Uh, so this actually works, you can test it numerically. But I consider this kind of cheating because you just introduced the edge by hand. What if you were given the ground state on a torus or a sphere where there's no edge at all and you want to know whether there's some signature in the bowl? Um, so it turns out you can still get this to work. Here's how you do it. So the geometry I will justify it with is a sphere. So you take integer quantum Hall effect on a sphere. And I'm going to cut it up like panels of a beach ball. So pick a pole here and a pole here. And let one panel be A, another panel be B, and the rest of the thing is C. So if I look down on it from the top, it's just cut like this. A, B, C. Um, and to start, you can go ahead and just compute what's the G you get. But this is going to have a problem. So we said G, for instance, detects whether there's a GHC state shared by the three parties. And if you take some random lattice model here, the short distance physics is completely non universal. And there's no reason if you tweak the Hamiltonian, you might kind of like nucleate some GHZ state shared just at this lattice scale here between the three parties. So if I go right ahead and compute G, that's going to be sensitive to all these like short distance tripartite correlations, which there's no reason to expect is universal or quantized. And indeed, that's what you find. If you just take it on a sphere and numerically measure, which again, you should be impressed by, for some 2D model of the integer quantum Hall effect, G, you just find some random non-universal number. So what we need is somehow to remove this non-universal short distance part and extract the fact that if you were to cut out these two poles, there's secretly a chiral field theory running around there uh, and detect somehow this universal part. So here's how it works. If you have a GHZ state here, you can always remove it. You know, if it's a short range GHZ state, you could remove it by acting with a unitary U of R uh, within a radius R where R is kind of like the lattice scale or some correlation length. Okay. So let's do the following thing. Let's compute G, not of the ground state, but the ground state where you allow yourself to act with a unitary of radius r uh, localized on the two poles where you have these trisections. And then what you do is you minimize over all the unitaries acting on the poles, trying to remove those GHZ states. And then I'll just call this the tripartite entanglement at scale r. Okay. And what you find is something cool, so we do this numerically as a function of the radius of this disentangling thing. And if you do it for the integer quantum Hall effect, it starts out with some completely non-universal number. It decays, and then it asymptotes to a constant, where the constant it goes to is exactly the G of the CFT for the 1D edge state. Whereas, so this would be for like integer quantum Hall, whereas if you do it for a boring non-chiral, non-topological phase, it just goes to zero. Um, so the picture here is not that the integer quantum Hall effect has G, anything has G, because there can always be short range GHC states. But somehow in the integer quantum Hall effect, there's some tripartite entanglement shared between the three panels of the beach ball, A, B, and C, which you can't localize over any length scale. It's somehow distributed over the entire sphere and takes a universal number, which is that of the edge CFT. Um, so that's, I think, a new result about the nature of tripartite entanglement uh, in, in 2D phases. Um, so I motivated this talking about PEPs. 
And people had conjectured that chiral states like the integer quantum Hall effect don't have a PEPs representation, but there's no proof. Um, so sort of what we're working on now is, now that we have an entanglement measure beyond the area law that detects the integer quantum Hall effect, maybe we can prove that having this, this invariant here can never be captured by the kind of entanglement allowed by a tensor network. Um, so that's kind of the next stage of the project. Yeah.